Okay. All right, so there. Uh, we're going to have to do things a little bit differently today because YouTube is acting up, so we're going to go ahead and uh, record this and then post it to YouTube later. Uh, and hopefully that will work. If not, then we'll have, I've got other plan Bs and Cs as well. Uh, so anyway, to pick up where we left off last time, we were looking at ways that you can interact using basic CRUD. Uh, CRUD is create, retrieve, update, and destroy. And you basically, with an SQL database, you want to be able to create records by inserting new records. Uh, you want to be able to retrieve records by selecting things out. Uh, you want to be able to update existing records and then, of course, delete or uh, destroy current records. Uh, we were working with this uh, video game database uh, where we've got publishers and games, and this is an ER diagram, an entity relation diagram, uh, that describes the relationships between these two things. So we've got a publisher, and there's a one-to-many relationship with the game. So the one publisher can publish multiple games. Uh, and likewise, we've got a many-to-many -many relationship here from the game table to the platform table. Uh, and that means that one game can be published on multiple systems, and then vice versa from the other perspective, one system, like a PC, Mac, uh, you know, uh, uh, Xbox, whatever, uh, has multiple games on it, okay? We went through the basic uh, insert, update, and destroy, uh, but then we also went through uh, uh, the basic selection of data. Uh, we looked at aggregate functions where you can count the number of records, sum things up, find the minimum, find the maximum, right? Uh, we used the where clause to winnow down our, uh, our results to only those that we were looking at. Uh, you can use that use string matching with partial matching. Uh, and then uh, we, we use the order by clause to order the results coming out of the database. Normally the column order doesn't matter, the row order doesn't matter. If you want to, you can change those in your queries and you can go ahead and impose an order using the order by clause here. You can do multiple things. So order by publisher ID and then name in ascending or descending order. You can also have queries within a queries. So for example, if you want to insert into publisher name DC games, you can insert into game name and then publisher ID. You can either directly get that or you can use a subquery to get that once it's been created so that you don't have to hard code that value. Uh, when you are inserting test data, we do recommend, of course, that you hard code values. So what we want to look at now are data projections because we actually want to produce some more substantial uh, you know, results rather than just, just the, uh, the, the raw data. Sorry, that alter should not be there. Right there. That was just auto-completion when I cut and pasted it. Uh, so what do we mean by projection? Well, imagine a four, or a, a, um, say a three-dimensional cube. Uh, that's a three-dimensional object, X, Y, and Z. Now what you can do is you can project that down onto two, uh, a two-dimensional surface. If you've got a perfect cube here and you project it perfectly down on a two-dimensional surface, what do you get? A square. Now project that again and lose it. You've lost a dimension. You've lost the Z dimension, right? Now you've got a square. Project that again now down to, from two dimensions down to one dimension. What do you get? A line, segment, right? Now project that down to zero dimensions and what do you get? A point, right? So zero dimensions is just a single point, right? So you can project data down on multiple dimensions. Why would you want to do that? Because you could, do thing, you could group by clauses here along with aggregates to produce new results. Here we've got a bunch of books. I've got three dimensions here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to lose one of those dimensions. I'm going to lose the title because what I'm interested in is the number of books, the number of copies for each author that I have in my database. Right? So for example, Norman Mailer, he's got two copies of two different books here, but there are 13 total copies, 10 plus 3. Uh, Douglas Adams, I've got three of his books. There are four, two, and one copies. So what I want is ultimately a report that says Norman Mailer, 13, Douglas Adams, 7. And because there's only one copy of Orson Scott Card books, I've got seven copies of those. I want to project that down and aggregate one of the dimensions together. Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to group them by the author. And that's what's using this group by clause that I'm describing up here. So there are two steps to this, at least two steps behind the scene. There's just one query. So Norman Mailer, those two things are now grouped together. Douglas Adams are all grouped together because I'm grouping them by their authors. And now what you do is you can project it down. You will take these, three, these two values and you will sum them up. 
You'll take these three values and sum them up. And the common factor here, Douglas Adams, Douglas Adams, Douglas Adams, that gets collapsed down into one value, Douglas Adams. And then four plus two plus one all get summed up, resulting in Norman Mailer 13, Douglas Adams seven, Orson Scott Card seven. Right. Now let's come over to our database and look and see what that query would actually look like. Uh, hopefully it connects. Mm -mm. I should have connected beforehand and give it a little bit more time, but apparently there are major network issues here today because I'm not able to connect to YouTube and I'm not able to connect to the CSE server or the, the Linux server. Yeah. The entire thing? I'm fine. All right. Okay. Fine. Let's go ahead and shut it off. Shut it on. Nobody says shut it on, right? Turn it on. Why not? Say what? It says the stream is out of the Oh, the stream's always uh, was was off from the beginning because of uh, YouTube. Uh, but we're recording this. All right. Yeah, this one's down too. Wonderful edgy roam today. Installed. It's not working for you either? No, it's, it's still working. It's just the Really? All right. Hmm. Who did you just connect to? Ed Jerome? All right, fine. I'll trust you this time. Oh, cool. All right, so other networks. Come on. There we go. I'm just tethering to myself here. I, I ooh, I'm not gonna read this out loud. No way. All right, there we go. Oh, come on, the entire server is down. Okay, no, there we go. All right, so. Ignore that. I don't know how many, how many of your professors would end up tethering to their own hotspot to get to an SQL server live because YouTube failed. All right, all right, wonderful. Ed Rome put in some uh, complaints to ITS. Anyway, so what we want to do is some data projections. Okay, this is, don't worry, this is all recording. Uh, I, I'm not going to go bother and cut that out. Uh, I'm not going to edit this crap. Uh, so data projections. Uh, basically what I want to do is I want to determine how many games were published by each publisher. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start in the game table here first. Okay. If I just select all the games, select star from game. Right? Actually, I need to use my database first. There we go. Green. We're good to go. Select everything from game. Right. Now, the publisher IDs here are listed, six, right, five, ten, right? They're not in any particular order. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add another clause here to order them by their publisher ID, okay? And what that will do uh, is reorder them like that. But I don't want to just order them. I want to project them down. Again, I've got one, two, three uh, uh, dimensions of data here. 
So I'm going to go ahead and change this from ordered by to group by. What that's going to do is that's going to collapse all of the uh, publisher ID 1s. It's going to collapse all the publisher ID 5s. Right? And you'll see that it looks something like this. All the 1s are now together. All the 5s five, have now been collapsed. All the 6s have been collapsed. The problem is I'm not aggregating anything together. What I want to do is I want to select the publisher ID. And I want to do actually compute something with this projection. I want to sum up all of the values. Uh, so count everything as number of titles. All right, there we go. All right. So now I'm getting publisher ID one, which is I think LucasArts. They were publishing three games. Uh, publisher ID five, which is uh, nin uh, Nintendo, I think. They, pay, pu they published five games, okay, dot, dot, dot. Uh, that's kind of unsatisfying, though, because who are these publishers? I, I, I remembered that because I've run this before, and that's LucasArts and that's Nintendo right there. But what about 13? I have no idea. And also remember that we've got plenty of publishers that are not going to be showing up here from publisher. Right, there we go. So we've got, pub, uh, like, for example, Sony Computer Entertainment or Square Enix or Sega. We don't have any records of anything that they have published. Remember that we have this parent-child relationship here. A parent can get, exist, the publisher can exist, without having published any games. It's a one-to-many relationship. Zero is still many, right? It's zero, one, two, three, four, and as many as you want, including zero. So a child record cannot exist without the parent record. Uh, but we can have a parent record with no, child, no children. Right? They're not going to show up in this report at all, right? If I run it like this, right? I want to see both the publisher's name and I also want to see a report that says that they've published zero games. Okay? Now to do that, we're going to need something else. We're going to need joins. We're going to need to take these two tables, this publisher table and this game table, and join them together because the, uh, the publisher name, that's over here in one table, right? but all the data that I want is over here in a different table. So we're going to have to join these two things together. Here is a visualization, okay? Here's a student table with four students in it. Here's an email table with email, four emails in it. Uh, now, one student can have multiple emails, okay? Uh, you can say that there's like multiple people can share the same email, but nobody really does that, uh, or you shouldn't, right? Uh, but in any case, what we've got here is a one-to-many relationship. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to join this student table over here to this email table over here. Now, how are they joined together? Well, over here, the primary key is the student ID. Over here, the foreign key that references the person table, the parent table, is also called the student ID. Right? There's the email ID. That's the primary key of that table. So over here, Sterling Castro has one, two, three, four. If I look over here, I see that his ID appears once with that particular address. And so when I join them together, I get that email right there. Uh, Anthony Rizzo, he's got five, six, seven, eight. He's joined together with this one email over here, Rizzo at Cubs. Right? And then finally, Ryan Sandberg down here, he matches two things, 9988, 9988, 9988. He's got two emails, so he's going to appear here twice. But what about Dale Sweem right here? Does he match any 1122? Does he match any records over here? Don't confuse that with this record right here, 1112, I guess. It's completely different anyway. Uh, but you're looking at the, e, uh, the student uh, ID, okay? So what I want to do is I want to produce a table that looks something like this, but I want to do it with a publisher and a game. Before we do that, let's think about some mathematics, okay? So basic math, basic set theory. Right? So a set is a collection, uh, is an unordered collection of similar objects, objects. All right, there we go. Uh, of, of distinct, I should say, unique, similar objects, right? A set does not have duplicates. So for example, here's a, a typical way of writing a set. I don't even know what's in there. I don't care A, B, C, okay? Uh, there's only one A. In other words, this is the same thing as saying A, B, C, A, right? Getting rid of that duplicate there is the same set. Also, even though I wrote it A, B, C, it's unordered. So this is the same set as if I had written B, A, C. It's just that that looks kind of weird, right? You, all, you always write it in order anyway, right? So let's go ahead and go back to ABC there. Here's another set, all right? B is equal to one and two. There we go, all right? 
So that has a different value. Right? We say that the cardinality, the analogy of a set is its size. And we denote it as with these um, uh, uh, pipes around it, right? And so how big is A? Well, there are three elements in A. Right? Well, how big is B? Two elements there, okay? Uh, and we also have, say, another operation here. Uh, the Cartesian product, or cross-join, is um, uh, a set of pairs such that A, A in A, have, have you seen that? Uh, symbol there in any dec discrete math course that you've taken before? No? All right, so that means in, so that, that this means that A, the element A, is in the set A. Right? And then B is in B. Right? So in other words, let's just go ahead and write it out here. The Cartesian product of these two things is A cross, oops, sorry, times B right? is equal to another set here. So you've certainly seen that before, it's multiplication. And so it's kind of like multiplication in that you take the first one and the second one and you pair them together. So for example, if I look at A, there's A, B, and C in there. So let's just take A. I will pair it with one, okay? And I also pair it with two, right? These are pairs. That's why I'm writing a parentheses there. They're ordered tuples, okay? Uh, now, A is paired with one and two. B is paired with one and two. You start seeing the pattern here. All right, and then finally, C is paired with one and two. Right, C with two. Right. Now, you have seen this before. You've seen this since grade school. Right. What if I told you that uh, A and B were not those sets, but instead they were math BBR right, times math BBR. Right. So have you seen this uh, scripted R before? That's the real numbers. Right? Any fractional value. So if I take the reals and pair them up with the reals, then what do you have? You have things that look like this, x and y, where x and y are sets in the real number, are, are values in the real uh, number set. Right? So does this look familiar now? If I call it the Cartesian product, it forms the x-axis and the y-axis. You call that the Cartesian plane right? or Cartesian coordinates. This Cartesian is all over the place. That's what we have over here in uh, our database. Right? So my final observation is going to be the following. How big is A times B? Right? Right? So how many, uh, how many elements were in that set that we just wrote down up here? A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2. Right? How big was it? Six. Or in general, it's going to be A times b, the cardinality of those two things. Now imagine that it wasn't three and two. Imagine that it was, say, a million elements in one set and a million elements in the second set. How big is this gonna be? A million times a million, we call them trillions, right? So are you going to be doing a full cross join like this in a database? Let's find out what happens when you do, all right? So select everything from publisher join game. Right? This is also called a cross join, right? but because you know, we like to shorten things, we're just gonna call it a join. Right? There we go. So I start with LucasArts, Sony Entertainment, Square Enix, right? Did they all publish GTA 4? No, that's nonsense. Did every, per, every single uh, publisher publish GTA 3? No, that's nonsense. Did every single publisher uh, publish GTA? No, that's nonsense. So what have we done here? We've done a full Cartesian product. Right? Let me show you. Select a count of the number of things from publisher. Right? 13, there are 13 publishers there. Right? I'll go ahead and note that as a comment. Select count of everything from game. 20, we have 20 games in there. Right? So what I'm gonna do is gonna come, gonna come back up here and I'm going to count the number of elements when I actually join them together. Right? Count. Right. And we get 260. Do you look at, does that number seem familiar? What is it? 
13 times 20, or exactly what we said over here. You take the size of the first set and the size of the second set, you multiply them together. Now again, I only have 28 records, 13 records. None of them make any sense, right? nor not all of them make any sense. If you, I were to do this something naively like this on a database, what would I get? A million times a million? That's a trillion elements. That's what many people were trying to do on their first assignment. For every single patient data record in the first file, let's go ahead and do every single patient record over in the second file, except that there were like 10 million there and 10 million over here. How many is that? 100 trillion, right? That ain't happening. So what we need to do is we need to pay attention to how this database was designed. Right? Any old publisher record is not related to any old game record over here. They're only re related if the publisher ID is the same. So I need to put that condition in there. Right? Don't just join blindly here. We're actually going to join based on that, what's called a predicate, join game on publisher publisher ID is equal to game uh, or publisher ID publisher ID except that which publisher ID which publish which uh, are we talking about here well now here's some new syntax in SQL publisher dot that's the table name dot the column name does that seem familiar C Java right many different programming languages use this dot operator so it's a it's a, a column ac accessor game.publisher. Only if the publisher record over here is equal to the publisher record over here, game ID. Publisher ID, a publisher dot publisher ID, game dot publisher ID. Okay? So let's go ahead and execute that. Now it makes it a little bit more sense. Rockstar Games indeed published GTA 1, 2, and 3. Right? And I'm not getting all of those records at all anymore. If you were to count these up, I'm getting 20 records now. Why? Because I had 20 game records. Okay? I'm not getting 260 records anymore. I'm only getting records that are actually related to each other. Do you remember what we started out with? We had all the problems with flat files, and then we introduced RDBMSs. What was the R? Relational. Right? Records are only re uh, relevant if they are related to each other. That's where the R comes in here. In fact, there's a mathematical definition of that that goes back centuries. A relation is a subset of a Cartesian product right? Don't, that satisfies some predicate. Don't worry about that. You'll get that to that maybe in a, I don't, there should be like a, a discrete math course that's required by computer engineering. Yes? No? What is it? What number is it? Does anybody know? All right. Well, in any case, you'll eventually get to that. Right, don't worry about it now. I'm just showing you this for uh, it's just background purposes. Wow, that was long. Can we shorten it up? Well, yes. One, what you can do is you can go ahead and not care about white space. Break up long lines on multiple lines. What you generally do is you start out with no indentation, and then each subsequent line you just tab over or space over or something like that. You generally break up on uh, keywords, right? So from, join, and on, I'd break those up. Not only that, but you can go ahead and sh start shorthanding these, right? As P, as G, so that down here, I don't have to write publisher, I alias it, right? Remember that we alias col uh, columns earlier, right? And you can al alias tables as well, right? So from publisher P, as P, from G game G, as G and then you can use those in your, uh, as abbreviations, right? You can't, you can't uh, abbreviate uh, uh, column names like this though, right? That will be the same thing. In fact, we can abbreviate it even further. This is so common that you can go ahead and omit the as entirely, right? Publisher P, game G, right? Once you get into the habit of writing SQL like this, you'll start omitting these things. You'll start alighting them away. Okay, great. I got a complete list of publishers right, along with their games. The problem now is that I, I'm not seeing all those publishers that were missing before anymore, right? Remember, let's, let's take a look at all the publishers again. Sony Entertainment, Square Enix, Sega. Do they show up down here in this report? Nope. Why? Because there was nothing to join them to. Remember, you can have a parent record with no children. So how do we preserve those? 
we need a different type of join. Right? We need a left join. So the difference is Dale Sweem, remember, he was not there. But we want to preserve him, right? And ultimately, he has no email, so he would end up preserving that student ID record and his last name, but we would have null because there are no email records. The only difference, excuse me, the only difference here is that instead of a join, you preserve records from the left, right? So it's a left join. Now, do you see the difference? There's Sony Entertainment, there's Square Enix, there's Sega, but do they have any game records? No, consequently, all those values end up being null, but the values are preserved, okay? So let's cut this down a little bit because I'm really only interested in the publisher name and the game name, right? Uh, generally, using the star operator like I've been doing is bad practice when, unless you're in an IDE like this. Uh, again, imagine that uh, I wasn't just storing publisher and game records. I was actually storing the entire ROM uh, for the game because I pirated it, right? Uh, in fact, there was big news about some emulator for a Switch company, company or a group or something. They had to settle with Nintendo and shut down. Yuzi or what, what were they? Yuzi, uh, what, whatever they were called. They had to pay, uh, N Nintendo shut them down big time. Uh, but suppose that, uh, that I still have all the ROMs, right? I still have, I've, I've, all, I've downloaded them on Torrent or something like that. Uh, and I'm storing them in this database because I'm going to serve them up to other people, right? I shouldn't be doing that, of course. Right? But suppose that I were. Now, suppose that I wanted on a web page to serve them up to list all of those games, right? But only when you request a specific game do I actually want to deliver that entire huge large file. We call those blobs, binary large objects, right? Now, imagine that you were using the star operator here on your database. You are pulling out gigabyte after gigabyte after gigabyte, sending it over the wire, over the network, right? And clearly our network cannot handle anything today, right? So, you know, you're wasting all that bandwidth for data that ultimately gets ignored at the other end. If you are not concerned with that data, you should not be sending it over. For example, I don't care what the publisher ID is. That's a database thing. I want to know who the publisher is, LucasArts. I don't care what the game ID is, and I certainly don't care that the publisher ID over here is a repeat of that, uh, that data over there. So let's only pull out unique elements over here. P.name, again, I'm using that, uh, that uh, uh, alias that I defined up below, and then G.name, right? from publisher P. Right? Even though I define the, uh, uh, the alias down here, I can use it before I define it. Right? That's just how uh, SQL works. It's what's called a declarative programming language which is a functional programming language, you are declaring what this is, not how it works, right? I'm not saying, okay, go out to this table and write a for loop to iterate over all the elements, and if that one matches, then put it into a result. If that one doesn't match, then don't put it in the result, right? I plus plus, I is less than N, right? I'm not writing a for loop saying how it gets done. I'm just saying this is what it is, and then the database takes care of it for me, right? So, the problem, however, is when I get that report back, do I know the difference between those two columns? I do because I, 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 I know who LucasArts is and I know what LEGO Star Wars is. I know that one of these is the publisher and one of this is the game title. But does that tell me up here? Name and name? Nope. So let's go ahead and alias those as well. As publisher. As title. There we go. And now, that's much better human readable report, okay? Again, it's the difference between a left join. And yes, there is a right join, right? Yes, there are right joins. The right joins would pre preserve records going from the right. So for example, if I just uh, move these back and forth, if I said from game G, right join, publisher P on those values, I get the exact same result. But all I did was take those two tables and swap them, right? It is preserving from the right now, right? Now the publisher is over on the right and the game is over here on the left, right? And then you're preserving from this direction. How many, how many of you folks read left to right on a daily basis? <laughs> Everybody. How many of you folks read right to left? Uh, yeah, you do? <laughs> 
Oh, okay. <laughs> For, uh, foreign languages do sometimes, and then translations preserve those right to left or whatever, right? Uh, but I don't, and I don't like thinking like that, all right? Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and not use a right join. Instead, just swap your tables and do left joins, right? unless you have to use a right join. And I'll show you an example of that later on. Because what you're going to do is you're going to combine. You want to preserve from both directions, right? Because you want one big flat file. All right. So what should we do now? Let's go ahead and combine these two things together to solve the original problem. I want to report with the publisher name plus the number, number of games they've published. So I'm going to have to use a group by clause after I join them together. So select everything from initially from uh, publisher P, right? uh, P, join game G on, I guess I should go from, be consistent about it, there we go, that's a little bit better, on p.publisherid is equal to g.publisherid. There's my uh, query from before. I'm getting everything here. But now I want to group them. Group by publisher ID. Now, how many publisher IDs do I have already with just these two tables, two copies? One over here and one over here. But it's going to complain because it's going to say, well, there are two of them there. In fact, it says column publisher ID in group by state uh, is ambiguous. Which one do you mean? Well, up here I said that they were equal, so does it matter? No, they're the same. But I will go ahead and say p dot because that's where it comes from as a primary key. Generally, when you group by something, you want to group by the unique identifier. Right? If I were to group by, say, last name, first name, which is a common issue that people have with the albums database that you'll be doing this week, right? Uh, is everybody's first name, last name completely 100% unique? No. I, Google yourself sometime, right? Uh, there's a... There's an uh, Irish boxer with my exact same name. Uh, there is a, uh, what is it, a New Zealander, uh, the New Zealand uh, legislator that, with my exact same name. And then an artist and like a poet and something like that, right? Uh, I've never actually contacted any of those other Chris Burks, but it's certainly not a unique name. But what is unique is your primary key. So when you group by something, you generally want to group by that. Now, this is not going to give me what I want because all I want is the name of the publisher and the number of games that they've published, not the games that, uh, themselves. So once I've grouped them, remember that I want the p.name as publisher, comma, account, initially what I'm going to do is account all this stuff, as number of titles. All right, there we go. Okay. LucasArts, three. Nintendo, five. Hopefully that looks familiar at this point because those are the numbers that we had before. But now we have their name, LucasArts and Nintendo. What about that, Delph that 13 down below, Delphine Software? Now I know who they are. They've published one game. The problem is I do not have all of the publishers. Remember, there are some publishers that have published zero games. I want that to show up in this report. All right? Come on. There you go. All right, it's getting slow. Hopefully I'm not using up my gigabytes. Right? Uh, that, that's another good reason not to use the star operator. I'm on a hot spot right now, right? And I'm gonna run out because uh, the month just started. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, from Publisher P, what kind of join should I have done to preserve those records? A left join. We're still not there. Once this executes, you'll see that Sony Entertainment has one game published? Now, LucasArts 3 and uh, Nintendo 5, those are un remain unchanged. But Sony Entertainment, Square Enix, and Sega, they didn't publish any games. Why am I getting one here? Well, what, are, what, what am I counting? I'm counting everything. I'm counting all the records that appear in rows. Remember, Square Enix appeared with a bunch of nulls over here. So what do you actually want to count that actually exists. If they've published a game, the game ID is what you want. Right? And now I'm gonna get those zeros right there because those game IDs will be null. And those uh, null, when you add them up, null plus null plus null, at least as far as SQL is concerned, is zero. 
the numerical value of null is zero. Okay. All right, great. Uh, all right, I want to know who's published more than five games. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to filter this further. Filter the results after the join and projection, that is group by. So for example, I want uh, where, where a, number, a number of titles is strictly greater than three. I want to pr know who's published four or more games, okay? Except that it's not going to let me. Where? Where only happens at the database level before projections, okay? What you need to do is you need to, uh, if you've got a table and you want to limit it down to only things that, that you care about, you need to use the where clause before the while, or before the group by, right? Except that we can't do that because this column doesn't exist. It's not part of the database. It's only computed after the group by clause. That's why they give you another keyword, having. Right? Having is a filter that you can apply after a data projection. Having number of titles strictly greater than three. There we go. Only Nintendo and Rockstar games have published more than three games in, the, in this data set, okay? You could have done having no games. There we go. And then you'll get all the uh, list uh, by itself of all the publishers who have no games at all. I'm going to go ahead and leave it as before, though, because that's a little bit more interesting. You can always change it. Okay. All right. So one last thing that we'll do before we move on is let's go ahead and come full circle. All right. uh, what we're going to do is we're going to flatten the entire data model. So normally what we would do is we would start out with a flat file with all this data in one big place, right? Just like you did for uh, your first assignment where you had all this patient data and it was all flattened, even though there was patient data and then dosage data. One patient could have many doses, right? There are two tables there. And to create those, I just simply flattened everything out. We then came over to a relational database system because we realized that there was a bunch of redundancy and other problems with it. Right? What were those problems again? Bad formatting, inconsistency, no typing. Right? There's always a question of, well, we do, have, do we have to worry about uh, whether or not there's a negative price on an iPhone in our database or in our uh, data tables, the CSV files that we give you? No, we do not give you bad data. Right? Uh, redundancy of data. Right? I don't want redundant data, so I'm going to separate things into the game table and the publisher table so that LucasArts, LucasArts, LucasArts doesn't appear as, uh, every time that you have a game. But now I'm going to come full circle and collapse all four of these tables down into one. Let's do that. Right? So select everything initially from publisher P, join. In fact, let's go ahead and do a left join immediately to preserve records. Left join. Uh, game G on p.publisher ID is equal to g.publisher ID. Now do another left join to the uh, join to the availability table A on. How are those two things together uh, joined together? In fact, do I even even need to look at it? I immediately know that it's going to be g.game ID is equal to a.game ID. Why did I know that? Well, because I've been doing this for a while, right? But also, let's observe what I've done over here in this database. Every table has a consistent name and consistent naming convention. All singular, no pluralization. It's not the game t games table, it is the game table. It contains game records, right? Every uh, primary key is named after the table and then I just slapped an ID at the end using lower camel casing conventions. Every uh, foreign key is named after the primary key that it references. So jump down here to the availability table. I know that it's related to the game table through the game ID. Then I know that that's related to the platform table through the platform ID. I was following the same naming conventions all over the place. No guesswork whatsoever. What was that primary key again? What was that foreign key again? No guesswork, right? Left join to the platform table p on uh, a dot platform id is equal to 
p.platform ID. So do you immediately see a problem with my aliases? There are two tables that begin with a P. I can't have two uh, aliases that begin with a P. So let's go ahead and use a different alias, plat, right? and plat, short for platform. There, all the way across, everything is preserved. LucasArts, Lego Star Wars, published on the Xbox in 2005. Uh, LucasArts, Lego Star Wars, also published in 2005, but on PlayStation 2. Right? There's Sony Entertainment that is uh, not, that doesn't have any games and therefore no availability. Uh, do we have any games? We have a game right here, Rockstar Games, published GTA 3, but it's not available on any system, right? at least according to this data. Right? All right, let's go ahead and winnow that down. I'm really only interested in the names, names, Publish year, because I want to know what year it was published, and the name of the platform that it was published on. So let's go ahead and winnow that down by only selecting out what we care about. P dot name as publisher. Right? In fact, you can do this. Oops. I would generally tab more over on that. P or G dot name as title. Uh, A dot publish year. And there's no alias needed on that because it's not ambiguous. And then finally, plat, oh, sorry, comma, 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 plat dot name as platform. There. LucasArts, Lego Star Wars, 2005, Xbox. If I were to dump this to, an XM, uh, to a CSV file, it would be a flattened file. Now, there is a pro still a problem here. Right? Even though I'm preserving from the left, what could I potentially be missing here? Let's come back over here. Can you have a platform with no games on it? At least according to the database? Yeah. In fact, let's find out if we do. Right. Select everything from platform. Oops, there we go. Down here at the bottom, I inserted two new records that were way more modern. Steam Deck and Playdate. So everybody knows what the Steam Deck is, right? A handheld Steam Deck, you, a full Linux operating system. You can download Steam and play Steam games. Cross your fingers and hope that it works, right? And then Playdate, seen that? It's a, a little uh, black and white LCD screen with a little crank on the side and little casual games, right? It's great, uh, but it's expensive for what it is. It's, it's 200 bucks, but you get an entire season of games for free. Uh, so those do not have any games in my database because they're way too new, okay? So are those records pre uh, preserved over here? Let's go ahead and run it. Do you, if I uh, sort these, I see a bunch of nulls, Game Boy, Mac, NES, PC, PlayStation 1, 2, and 3, Super Nintendo, Xbox, and Xbox 360. I don't see them, right? So let's write another query over here, right? I want to preserve everything not from the left but from the right because I want to start at the platform table then go to the availability table game and then publisher whether or not they have any games available on that platform I want that play date and I want that Steam Deck preserved I'm not going to reverse anything I'm going to go with the right join and I am going to read it right to left like a manga uh, comic book right there we go. Now, down here, I see Steam Deck and Playdate, and they are preserved, even though they have no games available on it. But that's still not satisfying enough. I want all of these things together in one big giant report. So now let's come back over here and review a little bit more set theory. Right? If I have two sets, what is this? Cat B. There we go. And what is this? Let me just cut and paste. Cap and cup. So what is this thing right here? This A with this uh, kind of an inverted cup right here. It's the what? Uh, and would be the, a good logical interpretation of it. But when we're talking about sets, it's the intersection, right? So uh, do I have a web browser open? No. Uh, let's go ahead and look at Venn diagram intersection. I wasn't prepared to do discrete math today, but let's go ahead and do it. All right. Images. There. 
if I've got A and B and I draw a Venn diagram here, that's the intersection. Right? Now, what would it look like if I did the other one? This right here. That's the union, right? So, union. Google image search, right there, there we go. It's A and B. So everything in A and everything in B and everything in their intersection, but remember it's unique. So if it appears in the intersection, there's X in there, X only appears once. So let's do the same thing over here in our database. I'm going to go ahead and remove this uh, semicolon here. And this is the one that preserves everything from the left. This is the one that preserves everything from the right. Let's union them together using the keyword union. There we go. Now, everything, is, uh, everything that has a match is there. Everything that doesn't have a match from the left is still there, but also everything that doesn't have a match from the right is still there. Right? And we don't have duplicates. Eidos has produced a, or a, a, a published a Tomb Raider in 1996 on PC and PlayStation. Right? Uh, and we're not getting duplicate records there because it's a set. Sets are unique, unordered things. Right? What would happen if we did intersection? intersect right and that is a keyword even though it doesn't like it don't ask me why it doesn't like it it'll still run it right what is it it's everything that is preserved from the left and right except throwing out things that are not preserved in other words it's just a regular old join right so uh, i do not get uh steam deck and playdate out of this but neither do i get sony entertainment that has no games out of it why because i wanted an intersection instead a union is probably what you want, though, if you want to flatten this entire data model. Okay? All right. I'll make sure that you have that in the notes. But what I want to do before we uh, continue uh, next time on this is I want to at least start a motivation on uh, the next part. I gave you this, uh, uh, this, this database here from, because I already created it and I already put in test data. How did we get to this point, though? How did, we design, how did I design this database and implement this database? Okay, And that's what we're going to look at next. Right? So there's set theory. I'll make sure that everything else is in the notes when we get to it. Let's create a database to model the, uh, the asset. I think we called it actually asset. Uh, to model the asset problems, uh, classes. Right? There was an annuity, annuity. And there wasn't a savings account. It was what? Stock, right? Uh, and then we've got an owner, which is a person, and their emails. Right. So let's just review what that looks like, first of all. I'm going to come over here to uh, uh, Eclipse here. And we've got the stock, we've got this, this asset, and, in, and this annuity. And there's my UNML diagram for it. Right. Now just a quick review here to motivate what you're doing this week. Right. If your uh, UML diagram is devoid of state, there's something wrong. If it's devoid of behavior, there's something wrong. If you don't have some concrete uh, 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 methods and some abstract methods, there's probably something wrong, right? You should be using the example that we used in class for, and uh, lab five to model what you should be doing on your assignments, okay? I've got an asset here and then down here, annuity and stock. We had this abstract method called get value because if I have an asset, can you tell me how much it's worth? No, it's an abstract idea, right? Uh, only when it's a stock do we have a number of shares and share price. Multiplying those together gives you the value of that asset. Right? That's what get value does. Up here, it is italicized, telling you that it is uh, abstract. Down here, it's not italicized, telling you that it's probably the uh, number of shares times the share price. Right? Likewise, over here, how, what is the annuity? It's the number of terms times 12, 12 months in a year and then the monthly payment, and that's the value of that thing. Specialized behavior down here, generalized behavior up here. What's ge what else is generalized? Well, the, the account number, the owner, those are all the same for whatever the asset and stock is. Let me also look at the person class. Where is my person class? There we go. There's my person class, right? And this is not inheritance, right? These are inheritance, these, these open triangles. Over here, this is saying that this is composition, right? That who, who owns this asset? Well, I'll go ahead and have a getter called getOwner that gives you the person that owns that asset through composition, 
Okay. So what I want, and the, uh, they have emails too. Right, you could do an email class, and I've got an example here. We'll look at that later. Uh, but for now, let's just go ahead and assume that this is all we have. What is their email? It is a list of strings. Now, before we go on, let's take a look at what that looks like. How did I design that originally? I forget if it, if it was designed like this in this section or not, but remember that we have a last name, a first name, a, a date of birth, and then we have a list of emails. Why? Because they might have more than one. What kind of relationship does that tell you that a person has with their emails? One to many, right? Uh, what kind of relationship would a person have with uh, you know, their, uh, their assets? A person has hopefully many assets, right? One to many. What if I change this so that you could have multiple owners? Uh, a husband and a wife bon both own the, the, the stock account. Right? Then there I might have a many-to-many -many relationship. Okay? We might want to do that when we're, we're designing this thing. Uh, but otherwise, how did I do this in Java? I didn't do it through a constructor. I said, wait, I don't want to have to load up all these emails all at once. I'll go ahead and initialize the array. And then later on, I will give you the option of, where is it, adding an email later on. Now, this is kind of a setter in that you're, it's, it's no longer immutable, but it's immutable enough, right? And this is way more flexible than forcing you to process all the emails all at once. For example, what if you had a, a sale class, right? And you created a sale, but you needed all of the elements immediately up front when you created it? Or is this a little bit more flexible, where you can add an item to a sale later on? Think about that as you're doing your implementation. What's going to be the easiest? At this point, let's go ahead and come over here to my iPad. Hopefully it still works, there we go, yep, good. And let's start sketching things out, right? Now, I wanna sketch out something that looks like this. This is an ER diagram. It's basically kind of like a UML diagram, but instead it's up for databases. Uh, that these, this little chicken foot over here is representing a many relationship. This is representing a one relationship. Each table is clearly labeled along with the columns and their types. Right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sketch this out like you should be doing, at, this is gonna be after spring break that you're gonna design your database, but you're gonna be doing the same thing. So now once again, let's go ahead and just sketch this out. We've got an annuity, we've got a stock, we've got an asset class, we've got a person and their emails. Let's take care of the easy one first. A person and their emails. Right. What is, what, uh, how, how many tables does that sound like to you? Two. If you go and at any point, what is that telling you? There's going to be two. So let's just go ahead and create one and two. Okay. And the first one is going to be person. Oops. Person. Come on. On. There we go. So should I call it persons? No. Do not pluralize anything. English is a terrible language to pluralize things anyway. Persons is one way of doing it. What's another way? People, right? Uh, what, you know, uh, sometimes you, what are the rules for pluralization in English? Sometimes you add an S. Sometimes you uh, change the Y to I and add ES. Sometimes you add class. Class is ES, Y, right? Because it ends with an S. Well, there you, all right. Sometimes you have an entirely different word. Axis. What's the plural of axis? Axes, right? Some completely different word, right? Don't, don't worry about that stuff. Right? Just go ahead and keep everything, keep everything singular. Now what I'm gonna be doing here is I'm gonna be following a more modern convention of upper camel casing for my table names. Over here with the game table, I went with an, uh, with an older school convention of lower case on all of my uh, lower, lower underscore casing, even though there were no co compound words, right? Uh, why am I using this more modern one over here? It's because it's eventually going to have a connection to my Java classes. And what convention do my Java classes use? Upper camel casing. Again, take the guesswork out. If you're gonna query out of the person table to put things into the person class, it's so much easier if they have the same exact name, lowercase, uppercase, right? Okay, let's start with the uh, person table over here first, all right? 
You tell me what goes in the person table, especially if we've already designed the classes. Name, just a name. Okay, I like breaking it up as well. Why? First name and last name. Right? Why? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, how do you know that it's not last name, comma, space, first name, or first name, space, last name? And how do you enforce that it's going to be consistent across all the records if it's just one string? Right? And there, I gave away the, another hint here. What are these? These are going to be both uh, here. Uh, where's my undo? Undo went away. There we go. Uh, all right. Uh, there we go. Let's make this a little bit bigger. Okay. Uh, oops. Nope. There. Last name, first name, and this is going to be a var char. 255. There are reasons for doing that. 255 is just ha has a historic uh, pe precedent. It's one less than 256. 256 is 8 bit addressable. Right? So back in the 70s, these things mattered, and we live with that, that to this day. Var char 255. Right? It's just a magic number that's used all over the place. Right, you can go ahead and shorten it 100, fine, but that's kind of weird. Why? Right? Is there a reason to shorten it? I don't know. Right? Do you know? No, but it's just like a default. Yeah, it's a default. Why is it the default? Because it's 8 bit addressable and it's 255, meaning that you have one space for the null terminating character. Right? So uh, there's historic reasons there right, for how things are stored. Okay? All right, first name, last name. Except that, uh, you know what? Can I move that down? Yeah. What's the very first thing I should have thought of? Let's come back to this database over here. What is the very first thing in every single table, period? Primary key. Named after the table with an ID slapped on the end, and what's its type? An integer. Why not a double? Well, that's just weird. Right? First of all, is 0.9999999 infinite equal to one? Mathematics says yes. Computing says no. Right? Uh, one divided by three times three, is that equal to one? Mathematics says yes. Computing says maybe, probably not though. It's gonna be 0.3333332 or 0.3333333 and then we only have 17 digits of accuracy so it becomes zero, right? Or it's gonna become four at the end, right? Floating point numbers are very imprecise. Integers are precise. Five is equal to five. Two is equal to two. You're not getting away from that. Why not varchars like this? Well, you could do that, but then you're doing string comparisons, which is a hell of a lot more inefficient because you're looking at every single character to see if it's all equal. And that character could be 255 characters long. Then you've got casing issues. Is the query case sensitive? Is the table case sensitive? Is the database case sensitive? Right? Is your session case sensitive? And those all could be different. Right? Don't do that. No guesswork here at all. Let's make sure that we have primary keys that are named after the table. Person ID, uppercase I, lowercase d, and it's going to be an integer. Okay. All right, what else do we want in our person table? A what? Okay, well, I've got an email table over here. We'll go ahead and wait on that, All right? And you know what, here. Let's resize that and make that a little bit bigger too. I'll leave that over here for now, All right? And give myself some more room on this. There, okay. All right, but what about the person table? Well, let's go back to our class. What, what do we want to model over here? What else? Certainly emails, we'll get back to that. But what I'm thinking here is date of birth. Right? So, date of birth. Ooh, what type is that? Yes, SQL does have a date type. Just like Java has a local date. Do not use it. Bad, bad, bad. Why? Because it is not interoperable. If you take MySQL database and you move it over to Postgres, good luck. 
right? Whether or not they support the same date formattings and the same date operations, who knows? What I'm going to do is I'm going to say that this is going to be a varchar for 810. Because what I'm thinking here is something like this. Zero, zero, oh, actually, what is today? Today is 2024 hyphen uh, March 03 hyphen 05. Okay, there we go. That's the ISO 8601 standard, the only correct standard. Americans get it wrong. What is it, month, day, year, right? Europeans get it wrong. Year, date, or day, month, year, right? Why is this one the only one that's correct? Because it's lexicographically orderable, right? You can treat this as a string and all of them will be in order according to time, right? That's the ISO 8601 standard, okay? We have leading zeros. We use hyphens here. We don't use slashes. We don't use spaces. We use hyphens, okay? We have the full year, the full month, and the full date. If we didn't use this, then we would have, say, three, right? And then what comes, after, what comes before three? Twelve, right? So December comes before March? Right? No. The leading zero ensures that March comes before December because of lexicographic ordering. So that's just my note, ISO 8601, okay? Now, I want to have what kind of relationship between these two tables? One person can have many emails. So what I'll do is I'll draw a chicken foot over here, right? This is a one and this is to a many over here. That's what this is, right? Uh, you know, over there it was like equals. Uh, some some places will use this or some you know curly bracket or something like that to indicate a one to many relationship. One to many. Okay. All right. Now, what belongs in the email table? Again, stop yourself. The first th thing that you do in any table is what? Primary key. Uh, oops. All right. Uh, named after the table, email, ID. It's an integer, and I should have labeled these as PKs, primary keys and primary keys over here. What else do you need as an email? It's just email one, two, three, four. Does that tell you what the email is? Nope, so we want an address, which is gonna be a varchar. And there I'll say 255 as well, right. okay? Now, the last thing I'll, I'll do, and then we'll, we'll actually implement this on Thursday, is how do I bring these two things together? Which one of these is the parent and which one of these, these is the child? Remember, the parent can have many children. So which one's the parent? Person. Person. Which one's the child? Email. So where does the foreign key belong if we use this as a model over here? In the... Yeah, the, the, in the child table. So you told me the child table is the email table, right? Let's go ahead and put the person ID over here. And that's going to be a foreign key. And it's also going to be an integer. Why an integer? Because this was an integer. They got to match. Apples to apples, oranges to oranges. Do not compare apples to oranges. Okay. Why did I call it person ID? Because that's what it's called over here. I matched it. Now, as, a, as an alternative, what if I had put it over here? Person ID. Right. Oops, there we go. Question mark, question mark. Right. So would that, what would that model? If I change these around and this ended up being the child record, then one email has many people. Uh, that, is that the relationship that you want? No. Right. What about another? What, what about a, an alternative here? What if I said email zero zero one, email zero zero two, email? These are all var chars. Zero zero three. Does that sound like a, the correct design? Right. No. What if I went with this? You can only ever support three emails. What if they have four? 
What if they only have one? Which one? Right? One of the two of those that end up being null, just so that you can have these fields. Right? You're back all the way at square one with flat files at that point. You have all the problems that we already enumerated if you design your database like this. Whereas if you have a proper one-to-many relationship, this doesn't happen. That's bad. Right? In fact, uh, make it really thick. Exit out. Don't do that. Right? That's a bad design. In fact, that's what's called a, a violation of first normal form. We'll talk about normal forms, first normal form, second normal form, and third normal form. And if you remember, Edgar Codd created the relational database system, or the, uh, developed it, and uh, the, uh, the mnemonic device goes, everything in the, in the table has to depend on the key, the whole key, and nothing but the key, so help me Codd. And that's first normal form, second normal form, and third normal form. Uh, we'll go ahead and design good databases up front, and then we'll look at what those normalizations actually mean on, uh, uh, probably after the spring break. Uh, but otherwise, let me go ahead and stop the recording since we're not live streaming.